and chat. And it's the highlight of my day. So I love interacting with people. Being an extrovert stuck at home is my little version of prison. Um, but opportunities like this allow me to get up, move around, put on my red pants, you know, feel like I'm a human again. Perfect. <laughs> So are you located in a uh, San Mateo? Um, I am in Redwood City, but our, yeah, our GSC Lab Center is in San Mateo. Um, Got it. We also have one in Boston. Yes, I Both am. Both are experiencing the work remote right now. Yes. So I've been to the, the Boston place a few times, chatted with Seth. Um, and I'm excited that we could actually do workshops because it was kind of floated that, you know, doing on-site workshops are like a little hit or miss, kind of depends on the timing and the topic. But doing a virtual workshop means everyone gets to participate and you can record it and anyone can pipe in questions. So it's, I think, a win, win right now. It's great. Awesome. And one last note I'll have, and I'll, I'll let you go too. Um, I'm just welcoming everyone in the, do we have a chat that anyone can post questions in here? Um, I can also, you can unmute yourself if you have a question or if for some reason you can't, I think I can as the host. So just, just let me know. Yeah, well, I, I see my good friend, Rachel O'Neill has joined us because we were playing trivia the other day. Um, she's very aware of the engagement strategy. So I'm excited that she's here. I'm gonna, I, at least I know I've got a participant. Hey, <laughs> but everyone else who is joining, let's see, we've got a number of participants. Um, if you wanted to try out some of the interface things, we're going to be playing with a few of the Zoom features here. So if you've used a chat system before, there's the group chat um, where you can just drop in, hey, what's up? But you can also chat with a particular individual. Uh, and one of the first things I'm going to ask you to do is actually chat with me. So if you want to try the drop down box on the Zoom chat and say to Dan Newman, who happens to be me, uh, and say hello, just to show me that you can use the interface, you can chat me questions and that I can see them because I'm going to ask for your participation. So you can try that. Awesome. Yeah. Great. <gasps> yes. People are chatting directly to me. Yes. Righteous. Um, another feature of the interface, if you've ever played with Zoom, is the nonverbal communication. So sometimes you just want to get a straw poll of where people's heads are at and you want to say like, oh, who's participating? Just like if you're in a room, you would raise your hand. So under the participant tab of Zoom, there's a raise hand feature. So why don't you try pressing the raise hand feature and show me that you're alive and you can raise your hand. Yes, people are raising their hands. We have life. Right? Just, that's great. There are going to be points in this uh, workshop where I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you've done something or not done something. So it's great to figure it out now, play with it, and have some fun. I will now lower my hand. Yeah, if you click it again, you lower hand. Um, yeah, and it's 2.01 my time, so it's 11.01 or, I mean, wherever you are, it's something 01, right? Um, do you want to do any type of intros to anything you want to talk about, Kate, before we get started? Um, nothing from my side. I think really just GSC Labs is, is stoked to have you. Dan is uh, not only uh, showing this webinar today, but he is one of our awesome mentors. Um, so anyone can actually, you know, after this workshop or anytime through Passport book a meeting with Dan, which is awesome if you have kind of individual questions you want to go through after. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I leave it to you, Dan, to kind of organize. And I know that this is a super relevant topic for all of us. Um, We're pretty much all working remote these days. So I'm yeah. excited to just learn a little bit more. Absolutely. So I'm really excited to present today because, like I said before, I am someone who just needs to talk to people. And having the opportunity to talk to many people while working through a medium that I've spent the past 10 plus years playing in, that... It, it just made me so excited. I wanted to kick up my red pants today. I uh, took them out of the special spring drawer of, of colored pants. And uh, let me put up my contact information right there. So a little bit about me before I get started to why we're all here today. So I'm the founder of Learn to Scale, which is a consultancy focused on helping small companies retain and engage their employees. And in today's kind of environment, engaging your employees is really critical because now that the crisis of kind of pivoting to remote life has passed or is passing, 
the next milestone is being able to do this remote work well. And the organizations that can do remote work well and engage their employees are going to see their employees stay longer, be satisfied, be more productive. So there's a dollar value towards learning in this workshop. Because what we're going to cover is some techniques to engage your people and give them a drive to want to stay longer and you're going to get a longer ROI on your employee engagement. And also it's just better. It's like if you're better at working remotely, then people are just happier all around. And we need a lot of happiness in today's environment, so let's be happy. Uh, this workshop is going to be recorded, so uh, if you happen to tune out or you have to step away, just you know, know that there's going to be a recording afterwards. And you can always email me, visit my website, sign up for a mentor session. I'd be happy to chat uh, if you wanted to go more into some of the content. So the goals for today. I uh, would love for all of you to walk out of this session being able to describe three activities that drive rem excellent remote one-on-ones, be able to explain how trust influences remote work, adapt in-person accountability behaviors for remote work, and articulate five ways to engage remote employees. How we're going to do that is we're going to go through trust in the absence of trust. We're going to go through better remote one-on-ones. We're going to go through accountable behaviors. And we're going to talk a little bit about micromanagement behaviors because that is a pit people fall into when they don't feel like they have control. They want to have a lot of control. So we'll talk about that overcompensation. Uh, techniques to engage your remote employees and open Q&A. If you do have questions throughout this session, feel free to chat me directly in the chat box um, or hold your questions to the Q&A portion and we'll try and address all of them and be happy to talk more if we need to talk more offline. Okie dokie. So, trust. Trust is an invisible currency. Trust is the foundation for a lot of the behaviors that we're going to be talking about today. And to successfully engage and retain your people, you're going to have to have some level of trust. So, Patrick Lencioni, great writer of the five dysfunctions of a team, should be on everyone's shelf. The first dysfunction was trust or the absence of trust. And in that book, he says, trust is knowing that when a team member does push you, they're doing it because they care about the team. And demonstrating care is a great way of having people feel motivated, engaged, and trusted. If you're an agile shop, then you're also quite familiar with the Agile Manifesto. And a chunk in there is about trust. Build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need. And trust them to get the job done. So this trust, as I said, is a foundation for everything else. Here's trust. Here's everything else, engagement, accountability, morale, motivation, innovation, et cetera. You gotta have trust to have these things work for you well. If someone doesn't trust you, they may not be willing to step out of their comfort zone, try something new, believe what you say. That trust is foundation. So let's talk about trust. Now, this is our first interactive segment of today. As I said, this is going to be a very interactive webinar, workshop, whatever you want to call it. So there's a link right there, bit.ly slash GSV trust. And what I want you to do is go to that link. And there is one question. Is trust given or is trust earned? Are you the kind of person, and think about yourself, maybe this is a philosophical stance or maybe this is just, you know, how you do things. If you have someone new start with you, maybe a new employee, maybe someone new in your life, do you trust them right away? You give them your trust? Or do they have to demonstrate that they're worthy of your trust and that it's smart to trust them? Think about that. I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Go to that link, answer that question, and then we're going to look at those responses. 15 seconds, go. Da, 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 da. bit.ly slash GSV trust. I'm waiting for you to fill out this question right here, bit.ly GSV trust. All right, let's see what some of the responses are. Head to this link. We got six responses so far. Trust is earned. Tough crowd. Trust is earned. I think there's more than six people in this, uh, this session, so keep submitting your responses to bit.ly slash gsv trust let's see those answers let's see those responses is trust given or earned 100 percent of you saying trust is earned any more responses i can also chat out to the group the link so that you can bit.ly slash gsv trust 
short link, Google form clearly. See if there's any more responses coming in. 10 responses. Oh, we've got a few trust is givens. Excellent. Not saying that one's better than the other. It's not for me to hold court over how you hold trust. But out of all the participants in this webinar, 80% uh, saying trust is earned. Oh, we got a few more trust is givens. Out of 13 responses. Great. Well, I'm going to keep going. So it looks like the majority of people tuning in say that trust is earned. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Now, here's the next piece of engaging with the presenter, doing a very engaging type of webinar workshop. Uh, in the chat function, there's a drop down box where you can select who you want to talk to. And I would love if you talk directly to me, Dan Newman, I'm the presenter, and chat with me and answer this question. If you give trust, what feelings do you have to prepare to experience? So think about this. You're going to give someone trust. Say you got that new employee starting tomorrow. They show up. They're so excited to be there. And you say, let me give you our biggest customer. I'm trusting you to do this well. What feelings are you going to feel? Are you going to feel unease? Are you going to feel stress? Are you going to feel pride? What feelings there? is going to get conjured up. What do you have to prepare to wade through when you start giving trust? Excellent. So we're seeing disappointment, heartbreak, vulnerability. Excellent. Love it. What other thoughts? What feelings? This is kind of like preparing yourself and thinking, like, what am I going to feel? Good. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Next question. So now we had a bunch of people who said that trust is earned. So what messages are you communicating, whether implicitly of here's the subtext or explicitly literally telling them, I trust you. So if you're the kind of person who are trust is earned, what are you saying when someone sits down and says, I'm ready for that assignment? And you say, uh -uh, I don't trust you yet. What do you, what, what do you feel? What, what type of messages are you sending? Chat that to me. Are you saying anything like, I trust you or I don't trust you? You have to be worthy, that you're not worthy now, that you know, you're not the kind of person that I'm gonna just open up to. I got a, someone responded, trust as a base slash foundation from the beginning starts a good working relationship. That is certainly a message that can be communicated if you trust someone right up from the start. Saying nothing and giving delayed responses, great. These are important things to think through. As a leader, as someone working in the startup space, you're going to be trust as a currency that you might have more of than actual funds on hand. So how do you dispense and what messages are you sending? You're saying, give me a shot to prove myself. If you say trust is earned, work doesn't get done efficiently off the bat because they can't just start right away. Great. I've got two more questions here and you can answer any of these. Feel free to chat them to me. How does trust figure into performance management? So performance management is going in and helping people um, demonstrate their skill better to help them uh, solve roadblocks, get past roadblocks, to be more efficient, to um, be more motivated, to have more accountability. So how does trust influence that? Does it superpower it? Does it slow stuff down? Does it ramp up over time? And then kind of as a secondary question is, what does a one-on-one -on -one look like when there's an absence of trust. So you're sitting down with someone that you, you manage or they manage you and you don't trust them, then what is, what is, there's become subtext to a lot of things. So what are some of the subtexts that start bubbling up when you don't trust the words coming out of other person's mouth? Or if they need to earn your trust, how are you protecting yourself? You start second guessing every decision, great. If you love your job, trust doesn't figure in. You do your job regardless of lack of trust. Interesting. 
performance management, honesty and openness with trust. Trusting that your manager has your best, these are awesome responses. Thank you for participating, this is awesome. Trusting that your employee will take what you say and improve based on feedback, that the feedback isn't coming from a malicious place. Ooh, that's a big one. That uh, if you give someone feedback, say, you know what, I think you could do this better. Is that because you don't trust them or is that because you do trust them and you think they could do better? Really influences their motivation. And you can see how this broadly starts thinking about their motivation and their engagement. This is great. Thank you. So let's pivot into one-on-ones because one-on-ones are a huge driver towards trust as well as engagement as well as accountability. So now using the raise hand feature, so that's under the participant tab, on the raise hand feature, just give me a straw poll. Who here has one-on-ones regularly with their team or with their manager? Just give me the raise hand feature. And regularly for the purpose of this conversation means that it's actually scheduled and it recurs regularly. Or if I ask your direct report or ask your manager, do they, and I say, is this a regular one-on-one? They say, yeah, yeah, it's regular. So who has regular one-on-ones? Use the raise hand feature. I see four, nice. Four out of 14, four out of 15, nice. Great, great. Excellent. Nice. Super. Okay. So you can put your hands down. There's the hand down button. So one-on-ones are unusually effective at a lot of things. That's because humans are really primed towards communication. So a one-on-one helps foster that regular communication and it fosters feedback. If you're meeting every week with your boss or someone that you manage, you are having regular communication touch points where people can share information and you can start grooming a culture of feedback where you can tell someone, I think you could do this better or, oh, give me feedback. When you have this on such a regular basis, the threshold of feedback starts to lower and you start telling them more and more things and it becomes less kind of like earth shatteringly soul crushing feedback moments of performance reviews when you find out all the things you failed at. If you just do it every single week, it's just kind of part of the dialogue and it doesn't hurt. It's just like, oh, okay, I got it. I'll, I'll change. Um, where's my clicker? There it is. So one-on-ones also gives you an opportunity to recontextualize problems explore different types of topics and brainstorm solutions. So the best one-on-ones aren't necessarily project syncs, but they're a way of looking at a problem that you and your manager or you and your direct report can have two perspectives on the same problem. And that allows teams to be much more effective and solve problems faster because you're drawing on two pools of knowledge and expertise and insights. And also, as a manager, you might have privy to more information that your direct report might have needed to solve the problem effectively. Now, one-on-ones also build relationships and trust and helps you uh, demonstrate empathy. Uh, Not as useless as the Winter Olympics, but uh, when you have a relationship that you can rely on and that grows and matures over time, that fosters more and more trust. And people leave their managers, they don't leave jobs. So if you wanna retain your people, whether it's remote, whether it's in person, Building those relationships over one-on-one conversations has long-term benefits. Nice. So here's some good practices. This is stuff that I've picked up from my expertise in the uh, learning field um, and also what's kind of out in the literature. As a learning nerd, I read a lot of literature about one-on-ones because what else do you do on a Friday night when you're stuck inside? Well, uh, some of the best practices are regular one-on-ones. Most organizations, when they kind of survey the people who are having one-on-ones, they're usually weekly or bi-weekly. And then it's kind of like trickles down from there in terms of like every third week, every month, every quarter. Uh, So having them on a regular basis and having a designated time, ideally a designated place, so that it's just part of a ritual. Something you get into, you snap into a place, and you talk about whatever you need to talk about. You have a collaborative agenda. Now that equalizes the power between the manager and the direct report. These are just generally good practices, but when you're remote, you can actually create these collaborative documents and that's gonna be your playlist. Uh, So asking the questions, how are you feeling this week on a scale of one to five? You got a nice little pulse survey. What did you accomplish last week? What do you intend to accomplish this upcoming week? Is there anything you need help or guidance on? And here are some updates from management that I think matter to you. Now, this agenda with these questions 
aren't necessarily the talking points of what your one-on-one may cover, but they're really important when you're remote that you need to know what's going on. And this is a great simple report, a simple summary of what you accomplished this past week, what do you intend to accomplish this week, and now let's talk about the big problems you wanna talk about. And if making sure that you're prompting this drive for updates from management so that making sure they have the most relevant information they need to solve their problems and do their work. Make sure they start and end on time. That's key. You want to respect the time. As someone who is very time-bound and very timely, respecting time means a lot to me, but it also signals how much you value the time that you're sharing together, which is also the relationship that you share. So if you show up late all the time, you're sending some messages about how whatever your thing you're doing before is more important than the time you share together. And ending on time, if you find that your agendas are going way longer than they need to, then there's a question here of what maybe should be delegated, and maybe it's an opportunity to trust them more with the things they're solving. And if they need a lot more help in coaching, then finding new opportunities to, to provide that coaching outside of the one-on-one. You really should be talking about problems together than just doing project updates. Scheduling quarter career conversations. So quarterly, just set a calendar event, say, hey, this one-on-one, we're going to talk about your career. You come prepared. It's going to be a couple months out. It's on you. We're going to talk about where you're going, what you want to grow, what do you want to learn. Doing this quarterly is way more effective than waiting to the end of the year to have that. So what do you want to do this upcoming year? Because so much changes. Like two months ago, did we know that we'd all be working remotely? No. So all those goals that we set up in December, yeah, then maybe not be so achievable right now. But having a quarterly career conversation allows you to pivot and change based on the changing dynamics and their needs while also not doing it all the time because you got other things to talk about. Feedback is something that you may be providing in one-on-one meetings. It's important. It helps people grow. Feedback is a gift, very awkward, painful gift. But you can make it less painful and awkward if you use the situation behavior impact model for feedback. And this is extra important when you're thinking about those remote feedback conversations because you're operating with less information on a day-to-day basis of what their body language is or how they're acting before and after a meeting. So situation behavior impact allows you to share what you've observed. It's pretty descriptive. Describe the situation from your perspective, describe the observed behavior, and then describe how the behavior impacted you. It becomes a very kind of objective conversation because people can change their behavior, but they can't change if they're a mortal failure. Changing behavior is something that, as humans, it's a lot easier to deliver that and say, like, you did this, now do it differently next time. And this situation behavior impact allows you to kind of describe from your narrow remote management position or being managed remotely and say, this is all the information I had working with, and this is how it made me feel. And then you follow up with the the comment of, so what was your intent in this situation? It's a very non-confrontational, but great way of sharing feedback. And then finally, the last two is documenting action items and documenting praise or achievements. Documenting the action items is, again, during remote life, great and important because you need to have some kind of track record so that they can refer back to it. You're not going to run into them at the coffee machine and say, hey, did you do the thing? Documenting it down and putting a a task item and saying, all right, this is the thing you're doing this upcoming week. That's, it's important for them to, whether as a manager or as a direct report, to have this track record of what they need to do, but also if you start going down the road of needing to terminate someone, you have that paper trail of, I asked you to do this, it didn't happen the next week, didn't happen the next week, didn't happen the next week. And that paper trail is going to be important as your business starts to scale to have that kind of data and evidence. And then on the plus side of the praise and the achievements, Document that stuff because at the end of the year, your performance reviews are so much easier if you just have it all written down. You don't have to go through your calendar and be like, do they do this good thing here? Do they do this good thing there? So document it there and then it feels good. It kind of counterbalances whatever action items or or things happen. Um, So that's a bit of what's out there in terms of good practices. Now, I just want to now transition into accountability while remote. Um, Let's just make sure that everyone is still alive and good. Are we still good? You want to chat with me, making sure that we're still sounding good? Or have I been talking to an empty room the whole time? Am I still alive? Send me a chat. Send me a note. Raise hands. Hands say that we're alive. Good. Empty room. Thank you for that feedback. Sweet. All right. Let's keep going. We're going to talk about accountability. Accountability buddies. Sweet. So when you're in person, there are some behaviors that you observe. And these behaviors that you observe help drive accountability. 
These are the behaviors. Taking ownership for tasks, completing the tasks, providing feedback, checking in. These are all things that you can do in person and see and there you go, they're, they're doing their job, they're, they're staying on task, they're great employees. Well, when you go to remote, you have to kind of translate some of these behaviors into kind of more general observations and you have to come up with new models to find them out. So taking ownership for tasks, you need to have a task setting ritual. For completing tasks, there needs to be a task completion behavior. When you're providing feedback, you need to have some communication channel. And then when you're doing check-ins, you wanna find opportunities for touch points. So in your new normal, where are these things getting captured? So let's go through ways you can capture them. Task setting rituals. Do you have daily stand-ups? Now's a great time to start your daily stand-ups. Have a Zoom meeting, hop in and say, this is what I'm doing today. If you're on a sales team or you work with sales professionals, I've seen this really well done in a spotlight. Uh, so the spotlight is when you have someone say, this is what I did yesterday, this is what I achieved yesterday, this is what I intend to achieve today, here's my goal for the week. And because you got a bunch of salespeople together, what do they do? They compete. And then they hear each other, they get to say like, oh my gosh, I, they're doing you know, that many calls, I'm going to do this many calls. So it provides a little bit of accountability and it gets people on the same page and motivated for a day. Another task setting ritual is a morning address. If you're a leader that has a lot of change going on in your organization, having just a morning like, hey, this is Bob. Nice to meet you. Hope you're doing well. We made a ton of money yesterday. Let's make some more today. Here's something you need to know. You do it daily. You could do it weekly. Just something to kind of demonstrate that there are tasks to be done as an organization. And then more asynchronously is the project kickoffs. So approaching initiatives more with more rigor so that you have a designated project kickoff. And we're going to talk about project retro, but making sure there's a defined start to a project or initiative or a sprint and having a meeting or, or some kind of ritual that captures that start. All right, next text, completion behaviors. Uh, there's a software called Hoopla. Hoopla is really nifty because it basically makes a virtual gong where your reps or people, when they do a task and they maybe close a deal or they finish a project, it sends a virtual gong, bong, and ideally you have a big room and it like makes a gong and it shows what they did and here's the deal and here's how much money they made. Um, but you can do that virtually too and people can just have it open in their browser and then suddenly everyone's there's that ritual of completing the task. And then everyone wants to have that gong ring and show what they did. Uh, so that's one software provider that does something like that. Uh, if you have Slack or some type of chat system, maybe sending an at here, we did the thing. Uh, maybe as a manager, having just someone chat you and say like, I finished the task, just FYI, so you know that it was done. You use a project management software like Asana. I love Asana. You press you know, when you finish the, uh, the, the, the task, a little unicorn flies across the screen. It's super fun. Uh, but then it provides a track record of who completed what and also allows me as a project manager to then see, here's all the things that still have to be done. A project Retro, as I mentioned before, and the spotlight that I mentioned before that includes yesterday's achievements. These are behaviors that now that you're remote, you have to figure out how are they getting captured and how are people demonstrating that they've completed a task drives that accountability. Virtual communication channels, you're probably familiar with quite a few. I mean, we are on a Zoom right now. Uh, you're probably sending emails and Slacks or chats or what have you. Uh, having a team meeting and making sure that your team meetings are effective while remote, making sure you have an agenda, making sure that you have a, a compelling question or objective for the meeting, you understand who controls the conversation in your team meeting, whether you mute everyone, whether everyone just kind of chatters on top of each other, thinking intentionally through your communication channel. If you're uh, an organization that has more than five people, it might be a smart idea to start thinking about anonymous surveys, where people can maybe anonymously provide feedback uh, that they may not feel comfortable necessarily going to the CEO or going to their manager communicating that about. Uh, when your organization gets, gets bigger, think about pulse surveys. So maybe weekly, you ask one or two questions, or monthly, one or two questions, just to kind of get a pulse of where people are at. And there's a million questions out there. I, can, I have so many libraries of questions. It's kind of like Wednesday night with wine, read questions. Um, so the pulse survey is, is pretty regular, whereas the employee feedback survey is a little more holistic. And this is, this is good behaviors for any organization to have as an employee feedback survey. But now that you're remote, how do you know how people are feeling unless you ask? 
And then the, the final one is social events and capturing those social activities. I'm going to have a whole bunch of things that you can do socially, um, but making sure that you're having these social events because different types of communication tend to happen in social events. And with all these different communication channels, it's really critical to clarify what information goes through which medium. So what type of stuff happens in email? What type of stuff I want to slack about? What type of stuff are we covering during our team meetings? What kind of stuff should go into the anonymous survey? If you don't provide those channels, then people may not feel comfortable inventing a channel to give you feedback or communicate. So do you want to give them an opportunity to do that? And that'll make them feel heard and it'll give you an opportunity to act on that information. And finally, virtual touch points. So if you're a project manager, making sure you have your recurring project sync meetings, put it into the calendar with the Zoom link pre-populated so you don't have to reinvent it every single time. Uh, your designated one-on-ones as we discussed. Virtual coffee breaks or social breaks are, you're gonna have to intentionally capture these, capture these touch points, whereas before it might have been pretty organic. And it might feel a little forced, a little awkward now that you're remote, but if you're intentional about it and say like, we're doing this because the people are a little bit more palatable to the, hey, this is the new normal. Let's have a virtual coffee break at three o'clock. Everyone puts down work and we're just going to chat, drink coffee. And maybe if you want to have a you know, private one-on-one -on -one with someone, say like, you know, go to your coffee shop. Let's just hop on a call and, and just chat about life. And then project milestones, find ways to celebrate them, find ways to kind of mark them. If you're using a project management software, identify them as, as a milestone so that you can take an action once you've actually reached it. Cool beans? Cool beans. So now this is a group chat opportunity. There are a number of people in this chat right now. Let's talk about ways that you think accountability behaviors can be tweaked and improved. So now in the drop down box, say chat with everyone. And I want to hear about one thing that you believe will improve accountability for your team, whether you have the power to institute it or not, whether you are actually going to pursue it or not. Uh, if you're a solo act, then what are you going to kind of talk about with your teams and your friends who are struggling with accountability issues? What's something that you think will help? Chat it into the group channel. And I'm going to drink some water while you chat. Thank you, Sydney. Chat it out to the group channel. Say the same thing to the group channel. Yeah. Nice daily objective. This is great. Trello checklist, nice. I like Trello. Daily stand-ups. What else? What's one thing you believe will improve accountability for your team? Great, these are awesome responses. Mm-hmm. Great, keep chatting those in. Keep chatting those in. Having a great time. So I want to give just a little high sign here about accountability and micromanagement. So accountability overemphasized starts to look like micromanagement. And as we said before, trust is a critical component towards relationships, towards effectiveness, long-term engagement. You're going to see an ROI on trust. Micromanagement erodes that ROI. So signs of micromanagement. If you find yourself saying these things, stop, ask yourself, do I trust them? Am I micromanaging them? So asking, just checking in on this before some things do. Do you do, you do that? You don't have to tell anyone. Do you ask, hey, can you just CC me on that? Why? Why are you CCing me? Do you trust them? Do you want to have a paper trail? Do you believe it won't get done? Is there a trust problem here? Saying, here's how I would do this before being asked. Or saying, you know, just, just let me do it. Yeah, what kind of messages are you sending there? You're sending things kind of like, um, you know, this is the right way and that's the not right way. It's also taking some of your mind share and saying, you need to do things my way. And it's kind of crushing their initiative or their innovation. And number five, we all do this. Mentally logging with someone's online or offline. So it's a lot of effort 
for what kind of return exactly? As a manager, are you checking to see if your employees are logged in? Are they showing up to work? Are they doing their job? Or do they actually produce the results you ask on the timeline they ask? Whether they're online or offline has no bearing on whether they are actually doing their job. They might be a leading indicator and say, hey, they're not getting their stuff done and they never seem to be online. Good opportunity for a piece of feedback. Um, but as also a direct report, checking to see if your manager is online or offline, you're taking some signals on their behavior. For some organizations, taking those cues is kind of a cultural insight. It, it's definitely a, a moment of social awareness. But when you infer a lot about that online and offlineness, then you might start going down roads of assumptions. And it's just better to talk about it with your manager or as a manager with your direct report, what are the working hours? What are your expectations? Do you expect me to be online or do you expect me to be available? Just some things to think about as you continue to be accountable. Now we're going to talk about getting engaged. <laughs> no, not that type of engaged. And uh, then I'm going to ask you for, for your uh, insights. So here are some ideas and some thoughts. And this picture is from uh, just, I just have a bunch of friends and we got together on a Zoom call and had Friday afternoon drinks. It was great. Just hopped on a call and had different types of drinks. And also someone was making pizza, uh, which, is, which is cool. Um, but here are some tips to engage your people a little bit more, especially while remote. Instituting gratitude. Gratitude is a wonderful thing. It's so powerful and it's so overlooked because it's awkward for someone to just say, like, you did great. Some people are very good at it. But for a lot of people, giving gratitude is awkward. So if you can institute gratitudes at the start of your team meetings or as the start of your day and say, before we start this meeting, what's one thing that went really well in the past week? It changes everyone's mindset. It makes them a little bit more positive. It kind of reminds them that there are good things in this life, not just coronavirus. So it helps reset the timbre of the team and engages your people. And over time, you can then use that engagement to kind of build deeper, more trusting relationships. Celebrating anniversaries and birthdays. In person, it's easy. You buy someone cupcakes or a cake or whatever. Remote, what do you do? Well, you can send a card. You can uh, send them a little gift card. You can send out a message to the team in the chat channel saying, it's this kid's birthday. Maybe do a little research, find a baby picture and post it out and say, this person turned one year older today. Uh, finding ways to celebrate those birthdays, recognize as an individual for something that's personal to them. And then anniversaries, things like a one-year anniversary, two-year anniversary, five-year anniversary. It's a chance for you to do something and say, hey, I noticed something that you started here two years ago and you're still here. Let me buy you lunch. Where's a place nearby? Let me just order it for you and we'll get it delivered to your house and we'll all have a, a team lunch together to celebrate that. When you start thinking about more momentous anniversaries, like a five-year anniversary, a seven-year anniversary, I've seen organizations institute a sabbatical. Imagine that, a three-month sabbatical is, hey, employee, you've been here for seven years. Go take three months off and do whatever the heck you want. We're going to pay you, and you're going to have a job when you come back. Go take a sabbatical. <sighs> that is super motivating when you're at your six-year anniversary and you're looking ahead to that seven years. Like, oh, my gosh, that sabbatical. I could do that thing. I can take that film class I've always wanted to take. You could do stuff like dinner at someone's house, though might not in coronavirus era. Uh, you can get them plaques, you can get them trophies, whatever. Um, there's a plenty of providers out there that help you with recognition, but investing in the recognition is, is, is insurance for long-term retention. Uh, social butterfly, it's a term I like to call the person who plans the fun stuff. So the forced fun committee, your social butterfly, uh, designate someone that, especially maybe an entry-level person or someone new in their career. If they are willing to step up and kind of have that Pygmalion rise to the expectations, if you step up to be the social butterfly and organize some virtual fun activities, that's a chance for them to build relationships across silos to different teams. It allows them to have some face time with different types of leaders. It gives them some agency to act on their own ideas and innovations. If you give them a really small kind of token budget, it lets them demonstrate their financial management skills, which it could be a great grooming opportunity for, for leadership roles. Is if you can do it as a social butterfly, then you might be able to do it as the head of a department. It also just drives engagement. Now, 
the real, it's, I don't want to call it sneaky, but the smart play is that social butterfly is now building relationships across the organization and can then tap into the communication networks that maybe as a senior leader, you may not have access to. Someone may not come up to you and say, hey, CEO, there's this huge problem, but I don't want to tell you about it because if I tell you about it, I might lose my job. Well, if they're talking about it at the social event and your social butterfly says, hey, there's a, there's a thing you might want to just take a look into and ask some questions around, Whew, new communication channel. As a leader, it gives you another communication channel to push out any programs, any major initiatives. Um, so from a change management standpoint, having a social butterfly is, is a powerful designator. Having a shared music playlist, so something like Spotify, and there are many other kind of out there providers that you can basically all sync up your music playlists together and listen to stuff together. And someone can come up with a playlist. Maybe it's your social butterfly, uh, your Friday, night, Friday morning pump up playlist, you know, let's close a deal, end the quarter strong kind of deal. Uh, those playlists are awesome because I'm here by myself. I can play it as loud as I want and someone else doesn't have to listen to it at all brings people together. Remote events, you might already have been doing remote events. Here are some ideas, a show and tell day. Grab something that you have kind of lying around and do show and tell. Uh, this is a thing from Hack Diversity. Can you see that? Yeah, kind of right there. Maybe, Bueller, cool. Working with Hack Diversity because they're a really cool organization. I'll talk about my relationship with Hack Diversity. Great, neat, show and tell day. Didn't know about that. Everyone else can show and tell. If you have a team of video game players having a video game squad time, if here's a place where you can just tell us your video game handle, what games you like to play, and maybe people can meet up on you know Wednesday evening and you know crush some noobs, Apex, or whatever you know is fun for you. Uh, bake off. I mean, I have access to a kitchen, and I'm actually leading a bread baking uh, series with a bunch of friends of how to make your own sourdough starter. So doing a bake-off where people can prepare different types of dishes and tell how they made it. And then they can eat it on camera and everyone could be jealous. Uh, and finally, the woofing hour where people do show and tell with their pets. I have a puppy. He's sleeping in the other room because that's a blessing, a puppy sleeping. And finally, different types of games. Uh, actually, on Sunday, I played some games with uh, one of the participants in this call. So yeah, what's up, Rachel? Um, there's lots of uh, virtual games that you can play. Kahoot is a great platform for games. Um, Jackbox games does a lot of kind of like party games where you just share your screen and then everyone can play on their phone. Um, right now, they're offering Drawful 2, which is kind of like Pictionary with bluffing. They're offering it free. And all you have to have is one person with a license and everyone else can, can join it. Super fun. So those are all my things. What's worked for you? So I want you to head to this link. You don't have to necessarily even fill it out now. Uh, we'll collect all the responses and, and then post them out either in, uh, in Slack or, or another medium. I'll talk to Kate about how we want to do that. But go to bit.ly slash GSV engage. And tell me, what's working for you? What type of fun social things have you done to retain your employees or engaged your team? Or if you're the social butterfly, what's the crazy idea that you're doing? And drop it into that, that uh, survey form right there and let us know what's working. And then we can share it out and we can all just steal ideas from each other. It's all very bohemian and we're just trying to make it in this new world. All right, we're right on sketch. So I'll drop that into the chat and then we will keep going. Bit.ly slash GSV engage. Mm. Oh yeah, I'm going to start the woofing hour. Nice. Um, on Sunday, it's just fun fact, my friends and I, we had a cook risotto together. So we had our you know, stream going and someone posted out a recipe and everyone kind of shared their own adaptations to a risotto recipe. And then we sat and we ate it together. It was super cute. Anyways. Um, so if you paid attention, if you were fully dialed in, you should be able to now describe three activities that drive excellent remote one-on-ones. You can explain how trust influences remote work. You can adapt in-person accountability behaviors for remote work. And you can articulate five and probably some more ways to engage remote employees. That being said, that's the end of this workshop. So there is a survey here that is really important for me because this webinar, this workshop is how I try and improve my craft and also 
sharing the best practices with how to do remote trainings in the future. The fact that I kind of reorganized my living room to now have a stage, I have a microphone, I got my light over here, I've got blue tape on the floor, that's all feedback that I received to help me be a better presenter. And now you can put blue tape on your floor to say, I should stand here versus I should stand here. Uh, so please fill out that survey. That's it's anonymous. It just gives me some feedback. And it also gives you an opportunity if you want to learn more. Um, I have a newsletter that I send out every other week full of lots of learning nerd fun facts called the TLDR. Um, and you can always set up chats with me uh, through the Passport portal to do member conversations with the mentors, etc. But now let's pivot to Q&A. So if you have a question or you have an answer that you want to share, uh, feel free to unmute yourself, turn on your video, say hi, and ask your question or chat it into the chat. Um, and then I'll, you know, answer questions as they come along. So, the survey is right there. And I will stop sharing. Cool. All right. Questions, questions, questions. So, um, I see Lana asked a question. Does your microphone plug into your computer or a local speaker at home? Great setup. Well, thank you. This is a... Uh, Samson Q1U USB microphone. Uh, looks kind of, I can't really see the title there. Uh, Q1, this was, was like an old microphone model. Now they have the Q2. Q2 is a USB, so it has this thing. It also has an XLR if you plug it into something fancy. So go on Amazon, I think it's like 70 bucks right now. And it's, it's so much better than your normal webcam microphone. And it's great for podcasting, good for voiceovers. And, um, yeah, so it's plugged into my computer right now, and I have a webcam on a stand right in front of me that has a ring light because I want to have that nice, warm, rosy glow. That's my setup. Why, thank you. I, I appreciate it. We have a question. Or, or a face. Oh, yes, that's me. Um, hi. hi. I'm Kate from GSC Labs here. Um, thank you so much. This has been been awesome. And, and for everyone out there, I have recorded this and we'll send it out as well. Um, I had a quick question. So most of our members um, are, are startups and with, with pretty small teams. Is there anything, any kind of specific advice that you like to give to, to startups if they're working with, you know, really small teams, maybe just, you know, a couple of people? Yeah. So uh, working with small teams really transitions from the systems and procedures and, and honestly apps and things people are going to try and sell you towards your interpersonal relationships. So anything you can do to maximize the quality of your relationships will behoove, will be much more successful in the long run for your startup while it's small. And what I specialize in is organizations that grow past that interpersonal state to start thinking about the procedures and the systems. But when you're small, making sure that you have open channels of communication, that you listen, you provide feedback, you almost treat it like a, a, a partner. Even if they report to you, having that low power distance so that you can provide feedback to them and they can provide feedback to you is, especially in kind of US-centric cultural teams, uh, is important just so that you have that free flow of communication. Because the people that you hire on your small team are going to be extensions of the entire organization and they hold so much critical power. They need to be shown that you trust them and they need to feel free to communicate that with you, which builds right on those trusting relationships. Awesome. And my second question is, is there a way to get involved in your sourdough starter class? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to share what I'm doing. It's actually pretty straightforward because if you have flour and you have water and you have you know, a warm house, i.e. something that has heat, uh, it doesn't even have to be heated. You just need to have a house. It's just room temperature. You can grow your own sourdough starter. Um, yeah, just send me an email and I can add you to my little list and send out notes and you can make your sourdoughs. I have a, I'll even chat it out because why not? Um, last year, I, um, my New Year's resolution was to bake uh, 32 different breads. And so I made a photo blog slash album there, bit.ly slash breadlife of all the different breads that I made. So I'd be happy to share some of the stuff from, from my bread life. Okay, um, there's a question in the, the chat. 
Uh, if we have to do layoffs, how would you suggest attempting to keep up morale after the layoffs? Whew. So layoffs are a very charged situation. And in today's environment, a lot of organizations are facing it. So there's good layoff hygiene. So being straightforward, upfront, um, when you have those layoff conversations, it's going to be painful, but you want to come straight to the point. There are a lot of best practices out there, and you can just read it on the web of how to approach a layoff at all. But when you're remote, you're going to have to increase the amount of follow-up communication with the rest of the team and really keep a pulse on where their heads are at and the feelings that they're feeling. You approach layoffs also as a change management exercise. So there's over-communication. Um, there's acknowledgement. It's not a secret thing because people will figure it out and talk amongst themselves. Um, being honest, having opportunities for people to provide feedback up, and doing that intentionally remotely is going to be awkward, and it's going to be in acknowledging, like, this is going to be an awkward conversation because we just let go half of our team, and now we are in a Zoom, and we don't know if we'll see each other in, in person ever again. Um, that is awkward. And acknowledging it, and then moving on. And treating it just as, here we are, and, and then trying to repair those relationships and making sure people feel that they still have agency as uh, a currently employed employee and doing whatever you can to kind of ease the exit for the people who are leaving because the people who are leaving are future ambassadors of your brand. And if you want them to say good things about you, even amidst a crisis, you have to treat it as a professional, high quality experience and give them a good severance package because it's a tough world out there. I hope that that's my opinion on that. Um, someone had a live question, Lana. Oh, hey Dan, um, first of all, great session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, but next time we want to see the puppies, so we have to adjust the timing appropriately. Yeah, I mean, I could grab them, but once I wake up a puppy, yeah. it's going to be game over. <laughs> you don't wake a puppy, you don't wake, wake a sleeping baby. My question <laughs> is, I'm just wondering if you've seen any best practices or you have any advice for all of us of how we help our teams cut through the noise. I think because everybody is so desperate to be socially connected right now and professionally mm -hmm. connected, there's just the deluge of information Mm -hmm. feels unmanageable. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice for that and how we can help our own teams. Absolutely. Filter. So communication is definitely, uh, especially virtual communication is a skill set that there are professionals out there who their whole job as marketing and communication professionals is help people curate and condense information into concise, meaningful ways. So if you approach communication at your organization like a communication professional, ask yourself, what are the channels that we're providing updates? Where are people able to provide feedback back? Um, are we sending emails on a regular basis? Are we sending them weekly? Can we condense it into a weekly digest? Is this a need to know now or is that a nice to know? Is there information on demand? Do you have some kind of intranet or some kind of message board where you can post updates rather than push them into people's inboxes. Um, and then you might even just have to have kind of a let's sit down as a team and say, these are the communication mediums for this type of information. And so this is what our game plan is regarding communication. Because there's the temptation that over communication is obviously a good thing, but it also becomes an overwhelming thing. And when you're getting it from not only internal your organization, but from the world at large, I'm a part of like nine different Slack communities and I get at channels all the time for the most important webinar you've ever attended. And I know that I try and do that too, but um, it's still, it's too much. And then giving some people some techniques and tools to manage that communication flow. It might be a worthwhile expert, you know, uh, exercise to do a Thursday lunch and learn on how to set up filters and labels in Gmail so that things get auto categorized. And if anything says COVID-19, it goes into the folder of COVID-19 and, you know, maybe it's marked as read or archived or whatever, whatever, so that you can help them manage those notifications. Slack has a bunch of flexible notifications that you can trigger so that you're not getting at channels every single time someone is mentioning something. I hope that, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Good. I got two thumbs up. Um, all right. What else we have here? Uh, good idea. A lot of discussions happen. happen ooh, great question. A lot of discussions at startups happen around a whiteboard. Any recommendations of virtual tools to mimic that? So visual communication is a is an important piece of communication. I actually have a whole folder of nerdy things that are COVID to COVID-19 related. Let me see if I can 
pull up as we speak one of the niftier ones I came across. It's this thing called Whimsical. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. So Whimsical, I just stumbled across. I mean, someone probably at channeled me. I was like, look at this cool thing. I thought it was really nifty. Um, it's got flow charts, wireframes, sticky notes, mind maps. It costs money, which when, you know, you uh, don't want to spend much money. They do have a, a $0 starter. Um, I just stumbled across it last week and it, the, I looked at a bunch of the product videos and thought it was neat. Um, in Zoom, there is the virtual whiteboard option. If you're, I believe if you're the host, you can enable virtual whiteboards. You can annotate. Um, there's annotation stuff where you can just do it onto a screen. Uh, Google Draw is a thing you can use. Um, one of the things that is one of my personal favorite softwares out there, which may not be as practical to super small teams, but as you start growing your team, I find org charts to be super helpful. Having an organization chart to figure out who reports to whom, very helpful. And if you can want to be able to sketch things out in case you're looking at succession planning or you're thinking about growing the team, being able to sketch what a reporting structure might look like, very handy tool. So this thing called Pingboard. I love Pingboard. I'm their biggest fan and I do not get paid by them, which I feel bad that I don't, but I love Pingboard. It's a visual, come on, Pingboard. Uh, it's a visual uh, tool that allows you to create org charts. That's it. And it's, it's just super duper helpful. I love it. It's elegant. Um, that's just a thing that I'm a fan of. So that's, uh, that's one of the suggestions. If you are thinking more about virtual tools, recapturing whiteboards may not actually be the best avenue and most effective thing for your time. Um, what you intend to communicate visually, you can find lots and lots of different stuff out there. And even drawing things on a pad of paper for your own personal use and taking a picture, chatting it to a Slack channel, or embedding it into a Google Doc and putting comments on it might be a more effective use of time than trying to teach people a particular platform or tool that's out there. There's a lot of things you can make do with um, without having to, to, to buy anything. What other questions are out there? It's 2.55. We've got five minutes. Um, I'd be happy to answer any more questions. You can chat it. You can unmute yourself and show me your video. Or you can send me an email or sign up for a mentor chit chat with me. Uh, happy to chat. So, questions. I drink more water. Anyone else? Okay. Then I'll uh, assume everyone else is just kind of listening along and, and, and going going forward to this. If, you, if you're interested in the sourdough channel, I guess I'm creating a sourdough channel. Maybe we can create that in the uh, GSV Lab Slack, Kate. Maybe that would be a good, good opportunity. Um, yeah, so please feel free to get in touch with me um, over email. Oh, question. What is the best way to over-communicate when working from home? Email, Slack, more catch-ups? So, uh, yes to hashtag sourdough, love it. Uh, over-communication, so let's talk about communication channels. So if you have Slack, great, it's the gold standard for chat systems. You're from Microsoft Teams, it's fine. It's fine. We got it. Um, I would recommend as a manager or as a leader having weekly one-on-ones with your team individually one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I recommend having them more often, i.e. once a week versus twice, you know, um, versus every two weeks or every three weeks, especially if your organization is going through a lot of change or there's a lot of unknowns. Having more one-on-ones is generally better. Having them more than once a week eliminates kind of the reason of why you're having a one-on-one. -on -one. You can have project sync up meetings. You can have them daily. It's important as a meeting hygiene tip that your meetings have a purpose. So having a stand-up, what is the purpose of this stand-up? If you have a meeting that happens every week, what is the purpose of this meeting? If you don't have a purpose, if it's just kind of a catch-all meeting, cancel it. Give them people time back. That's just good meeting hygiene. But when you're virtual, making sure that you're also being aware of, we're not communicating face-to-face, -face, so 
what are we going to do? We're going to do an end of day stand up summary because we can't see each other face to face. Let's just do a quick summary at the end of the day, every single day. That's another way of capturing the, that feedback and communication. Um, I see email as something that should be less, uh, should be more asynchronous. So if you're sending an email and expecting a response in the next hour, perhaps Slack is a better medium for that type of communication. Um, and then clarifying to your team is when I send an email, I expect a response in four hours. I expect responses at all hours of the day, or I don't expect a response after 7 p.m. at night. 7 p.m. to 6 a.m., 7 a.m. the next day, don't worry about sending emails. That, again, is still kind of good communication hygiene, but when you're remote, you're going to have to be a little bit more intentional about those types of things. Um, so I, I think, you know, catch-ups matter as much uh, as often as, uh, as your team goes through change. All right, it's 2.58. I'm going to give you two minutes to go do whatever you need to do, move on to your three o'clock meeting. My name's Dan. It was really great to chat with all of you. My email is dan at learntoscale.us. I help organizations retain employees, and I love talking about whatever because I am an extrovert and I'm stuck at home. So anytime I can talk to people gives me a reason to wake up out of bed in the next morning. Uh, so keep me alive. Send me emails. Love to chat. Can I put my survey link back up? You betcha. Let me just share my screen, and I will put that survey link back up. Uh, ba -da -ba, ba -da -bum 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 -bum. Thanks, Dan. We'll, re we'll post this uh, recording as well in Slack for everybody. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, if you need that survey link again, it's bit.ly slash GSV remote. Slash GSV. Remote. Thanks, everyone. Maybe I'll go grab my, my dog. Maybe maybe I'll wake him up. Yeah, for those people who are still sticking around, it's like that last minute treat. Let me go grab Mr. Noodles. <laughs> Those of you are still sticking around, this is Roman Noodles, waking up from a nap. He's a 13-week-old standard poodle. He's super cute. I gave him a trim this weekend. He matches my shirt. Don't you, boy? You know, I got you so that the hair wouldn't mark on my shirt. Right? Hey, guys. Want to say hi to everyone? Hi. Oh, he's so sleepy. Okay. I know he is super cute. He's getting big too. Yes, this is Roman Noodles. Hey boy. Oh my gosh, she's coming back to sleep. All right, everyone move on with their lives. This is just a puppy. Hey guy, wanna go in your bed? I'll put you in your bed over here. There you go. Oh, you got hiccups. Oh, poor guy. Here, good boy. Okay, bye.